It's always a pleasure to uh, see old friends here. And as you people say in the South, I've been knowing David Neal a long time. Uh, when he first said that he wanted to collect Marian correspondence, most of us thought, this poor child is deluded. <laughs> Does he not know that Bass says that Marion was semi-literate? Now, how much correspondence could there be from a semi-literate guerrilla fighter? And if he did write anything, how could it possibly have survived all of this time? Well, if you completed your assignment and read this, you know that he has gathered over 650 pieces of communication for Francis Marion. David, we were wrong. <laughs> you were right. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce David, who will tell you more about his quest. Thank you. Personal. 
But uh, as, we've, as we've heard, we know a lot about Marion's life. A lot of it is found in biographies of Robert Bass, and uh, you rank the, probably the two primary biographers. Uh, Mason Locke Weems was probably the first one to at least develop a romanticized biography that he uh, embellished when he, when he embellished the story of the Peter O'Reilly supply. Uh, but what I've been finding in all my research is that there is a lot that has, that has been missing in the biographies, uh, mainly dealing with Francis Marion's later life. And in addition, there are some actual errors of what has been reported. So I guess what you could say is I'm going to try and present today is some of the revisionist history that I'm not necessarily going to say I have completely documented as being factual, but if nothing else, as I was talking with uh, Bob Barrett, he used the term, the term uh, at least I'm bringing it up so it will continue to percolate. I thought that was a, the perfect word to use. Uh, instead of looking deeper and deeper and deeper into, into some of these things, it may prove better just to bring out what I found that suggests differences in Marion's life as we know it. And maybe some other people can kind of get in, interested into it, and maybe they'll happen upon other information that will either document what I'm saying or, or take us on another direction, which would be fine with me also. <coughs> in attempting to determine what I want to talk about this year, I sent an email to George and Carol, and I just outlined a long list of what I was going to call Marion Unmasked. George emailed me back saying that you probably would just kind of go with a couple subjects, a couple of topics instead of a long laundry list of, of these uh, little, what you might call trivial, trivial details of Mary's life that really aren't, hadn't been uh, ex anyone been exposed to. So I kind of did a little bit of a compromise here. So what I'm really going to do is I'm going to use a letter that was written by Francis Marion. <coughs> It's the last letter he wrote that I have been able to find, and it was written to Master Francis Marion Dwight on November 8, 1794. I'm trying to try and use it as less like a, like a thread that kind of traces different parts of his life. Now, if you, the significance here of November 8, 1794 is that Francis Marion died what, three months later. So we're, we're right at the, at the tail end of his life. And it, even even with that, you expect that, well, what's the, what, you, what's the, what is going to be revealed when a person is three months from his, from his death? Especially for those of us who are interested in, primarily in Francis, General Francis Marion, the Swamp Fox. And we know that when, when you're three months from, from death, you're probably not going to be considered as being a Swamp Fox. Because you're, never, you're probably not moving as well as you might uh, like to move or anyone else would like you. But uh, it still seems like a reasonable place to go after reading through some of these, some of these letters.
Francis Marion writes, I received one letter from you since you left us. Gabriel Jignat, the bearer of this, will, I hope, deliver you this. He just now setting out with Mr. Thus and have not time to say more. Only your aunt is well and hearty, as well as <coughs> Major V. Doe. Myself is very ailing, with constant pain in my head for some time. By cold but ardent fever. It gives me a great deal of pleasure to find you are so satisfied in your situation and hope you make good use of the opportunity you have in your learning as you are advancing in years fast and your time of education is short. The potatoes would have sent you but was disappointed in not knowing sooner. The cramp is in my fingers and cannot write more. Your aunt desires your affection and love to you, and Major Bideau desires to be remembered to you, and am, dear Frank, your affectionate uncle, Francis Merrick. As we can see, this is not the Francis Marion of uh, earlier uh, correspondence that he written to. So at that point in time was Francis Marion Dwight, who was his grand nephew, and who would later become his adopted son, Francis Marion. Uh, at this point in time, uh, At this point in time, we still have General Francis Marion, but we can see this is not the, the man that we have been dealing with. So before I delve into some of the other aspects of the letter, I want to first uh, summarize the, the general Francis Marion, the military career of Francis Marion, because it, uh, it, it is worth just doing a quick synopsis of. <coughs> heard a lot about his French and any war uh, history. Just real quickly, you can just you can kind of read that. But he did participate, start out in the militia with his brother Gabriel. And then he joined he joined uh, the militia again in when the when the Cherokee War began. And I made reference to that 1759 letter that he wrote along with Christopher Gasson and a bunch of other folks. And then in 1760 he was also lieutenant under William Moultrie. Cherokee War, where they actually went and did some fight up in the, uh, where they actually just destroyed the Cherokee uh, towns. But then a 15 year uh, gap between the French and Indian War, then when we, then we actually had the Revolution War beginning. At that point in time, we had a uh, differentiation in the Army because initially we had the, the South Carolina forces were a provincial army. At that point, beginning of the war, Marion was elected a captain in the 2nd South Carolina Regiment. At that point in time, the uh, officers, captain below, at least the captains themselves, were elected by the fellow officers. Marion was received the third most votes of all the captains, which would give you an indication that he was that his he was he was uh, respected as it, for his military skills, even even then. And then February 76, right about the time when we have a transition from the provincial uh, army over to becoming actual part of the Continental Army, Mary became a major in the 2nd Regiment. Up to that point, everything is pretty clear as far as the documentation goes and the history. However, starting in se September 1776, you'll see I also have or November 7, 1776, Mary became a lieutenant colonel in the 2nd Regiment. This was as a result of uh, William Moultrie's being promoted to a brigadier general as a result of the, the Battle of Solomon Island. Marion became the lieutenant colonel or second in command of the 2nd Regiment when Isaac Mott was promoted to the, the colonel or the regimental commander. The South Carolina Historical Society in a, mag in a magazine article in 1907 shows that Marion became Lieutenant Colonel in September of 1776. However, Marion's orderly book 
chose Marion to become a lieutenant colonel of the 2nd Regiment in November of 1776. So already there's some a little bit of uh, uh, differences in when these events actually occurred. And to make things even worse, uh, there's a document that some of you may have seen this. I know it's at the Francis Marion University, I believe, where it's the actual commission of Francis Marion who became the Lieutenant Colonel Commandant. And that is dated. You probably can't see it. The date on this commission is September of 1776, when he became Lieutenant Colonel Commandant. We have been talking about Lieutenant Colonel. Now we have different ranks, different dates, and this, this actual commission is actually has been backdated from, it was actually issued in 1782. So basically either Mary never received the commission or it was lost or something, but six years later, a, a commission was, was regenerated. So this is dated 1782 for a commission of, in 1786. So, Coming back to that, we have him either as a lieutenant colonel in September or November 1776, or lieutenant colonel commandant in September 1776. So his actual rank, dates, seniority dates, are, uh, are as far as I'm really subject to question. In his biographies, they actually have them, I believe, one has a 1780, uh, they have different dates, one has a 76, one has a 1778. Uh, however, I think something got cut off the bottom of this. In September 1770 is the date that he actually became, as far as I'm concerned, what I can find, he actually became the Lieutenant Colonel Commandant. And the justification for this is that uh, in May of 1778, the Continental Congress, in its wisdom, decided that uh, the commander of a regiment should be a lieutenant colonel. Heretofore, they had been the colonel was the rank of the, the regimental command of, a, of an infantry unit. Marion, when he became Marion at that time, was already a lieutenant colonel. So when he when he changed over to become regimental commander at the at the resignation of Isaac Mott in 1778, instead of becoming a a, a full colonel. He became Lieutenant Colonel Commandant. And the, the statement made was that you, you will become a, uh, the head of the, the, head of, the uh, of a regiment would be called Lieutenant Colonel, Lieutenant Colonel, Colonel Commandant. However, at their next promotion, they would become a Brigadier General. So keep that in mind that Marion, based on Congress's uh, decisions, next rank after Lieutenant Colonel Commandant would be Brigadier General. This becomes an issue down the road just a little bit. So what we have is we have differences of rank. We have a commission that appears to me to be an error, just basically just a blatant mistake, probably because it was generated six years after the actual date that it should have been. There's some of our issues. Uh, I'm going to switch back over because I'm going in, in basically in chronological order of, it, of his military career. So, 78, 1778, he's Lieutenant Colonel Commandant. This is the Continental Army. But 1780, May 1780, all of a sudden, there is no more Continental, well, there is no South Carolina Continental Regiments because Charleston has followed. Marion, of course, is up recuperating up in the, up in the uh, swamps as a result of being uh, injured in the fall after trying to exit from a party. And uh, luckily he is he is not among those captured at the Siege of Charleston. He Mary recovers and in late 1780 he, he next services more this servicing here is not as a physical servicing, but more of different different ranks. Yeah. After he after Charleston you never see any rank on Marion uh, until one instance in late 1780 when there was a, you know, a letter printed in the Charleston Royal Gazette, which would have been a loyalist newspaper at that time, where Mary, where, which is signed Francis Marion, Colonel Commandant, Craven County Militia. 
This is the first and only time where he has ever, ever, ever had this rank, and the first time this Craven County militia is, is really mentioned. Because one thing, there was no more Craven County at this time. It had been changed, and I don't know all the details beyond that, but Craven County was no longer in existence at that time. Then finally, December of 1780, the end of December 1780, or maybe it might have been, might have been January 1781, John Rutledge then appoints uh, Francis Marion as Brigadier General of Militia. So that's where he winds up being until the end of the war, the Brigadier General of Militia. But now we come to the now the war is over. You will remember that Francis Marion had been promoted to a Lieutenant Colonel Commandant instead of becoming a full colonel. So we would expect that in 17, in September 1783, when the, all these lieutenant colonels are now being promoted to that, to that rank that they thought they would get, which would have been Brigadier General. Instead, Francis Marion in September 1783 is promoted to a colonel, not Brigadier General. As, it, as the Continental Congress wrote the resolution of 27 May 1778 notwithstanding. So in essence, the Continental Congress told Francis Marion in 1778 that he was going to be a, his next, his next promotion would be a Brigadier General. And in 1783 they tell him, just kidding, you're not going to be, you're only going to be a Colonel, not a Brigadier General. Uh, reasons why this didn't go through, uh, possibly because there were too many Lieutenant Colonels, and all of a sudden you'd have all these Brigadier Generals floating around, there's no more to fight anymore. Could have been a monetary issue because of the pay. Uh, these are some of the things that Karen McNutt has kind of pointed out to me. Uh, I don't really know. To me, it was just like a cheap, a cheap shot because uh, this is a reward for service to your country. If, if anything, why would you bother even promoting anybody at that point in time? The war is basically over, not officially, but it would, it would soon be over. And why they would promote it to a colonel and not the brigadier general, to me, is more of a slap in the face. We go to his post-war career. Uh, I'm gonna, there's a lot of words about I'll try and go through them a little more quickly. Marion became a commandant of Fort Johnson. This was still as a Brigadier General of Militia. That was basically for gratitude for his services in the war. And he was given an annual salary of 500 pounds. And then only four years later, there had been a change in the political climate. And Marion was still a commandant. However, he takes a pay cut. Tell me a, a severe financial uh, issues here, I suppose. Francis Marion takes more than an 80% pay cut just so he could still stay out of the commandant. Part of the issue was that is not only that, to get that 80% pay cut, he had to show up every day for work. He had to live the fort in order to take an 80% pay cut. So I think that's just a really nice thing for the, the General Assembly of, of uh, South Carolina to do to cut his pay by 80% and make him go to work every day because he had to live at the floor. Uh, surprisingly, I mean, if I'm, if, if, if I'm trying to put myself in his shoes, if I've just been given that 80% pay cut and I have to live at this floor, I think I'm probably just going to say, forget it. I'm just not going to bother because there's really not much to gain from living at Fort Johnson for 365 days a year. But he continued to. He didn't even resign until a year later, which I found kind of surprising. And then one final, the final aspect of his, of his military career, and, and this kind of brings up some of the old tensions within the militia structure in South Carolina, and that is that he decided to uh, realign the militia in South Carolina, and they now are going to elect the major generals of the militia. They have a lower division and an upper division. The upper division, uh, Andrew Pickens was elected as a, ma as a major general. In the lower division, we have we have the cliques that are that are all formed. And all of a sudden, both Marion and Sumter are nominated to be to be the major general. And in order to, uh, I'm <coughs> presuming, avoid some major brouhaha, uh, the let's say the major the major power brokers go to Charles Coatsworth Pinckney and ask him if he would serve as the Major General Militia as a compromise candidate. And apparently, 
Pinckney agreed, but only if the vote was unanimous. And of course, we know that the, the feelings for Marion, the feeling for Sumter, things could get pretty heated as they were between Marion and Sumter themselves. I mean, these guys didn't apparently did not really get along too well. If you reading any of their correspondence, it was a situation where one would tell the other what to do, and, and then the other would just pretty much ignore the situation where they just they gave, paid, a, they paid a lot of lip service to each other. And Marion being the, the junior officer to Sumter, uh, there was a, a, undoubtedly there were a significant amount of ill feelings. So what, what, what occurred then was there was in essence a, pro, a I'll, I'll call it a protest vote. Uh, Pinckney was voted uh, by the majority as a major general, but instead of the vote being unanimous, Marion got his 22 votes, one more vote than Sumter. So we look at like kind of look at that in retrospect and say, well, nevertheless, Marion is still a man because he beat Sumter by one vote. I think of Marion in 1794 with his health probably starting to deteriorate. He, I would not be surprised he wasn't too, he wasn't that disappointed that he didn't win. I don't think I would have been at that age. But don't forget, in 1794, Francis Marion was 62 years old, and those are 62 hard years of living. They weren't the they weren't really that easy. And this, this is the, uh, uh, the photo of the bus that you see basically right in front of you from above by our announcements. So that kind of fixes up Marion's uh, military career. And we see that there were some, some changes from what uh, the traditional biographers, biographers have written. Uh, at the same time, Marion is going through the, the uh, his finish of his military career. He also finally develops a personal life, which, uh, once again, he didn't have a personal life before the war, at least we know. Maybe he really did, but we, uh, however, there's nothing really been documented that I've ever, ever been able to find. However, in, in 1786, Marion married his first cousin, Mary Esther Bedeau, who at that time would have been 48 years old, and Francis Marion would have been 54 years old. This, and this is in the letter that Francis Marion wrote to Master Francis Marion Dwight, this Mary S. Bideau is your aunt is well and hearty. And I think the continuation was as uh, as is Major Bideau, who I'm um, not sure who that Major Bideau is because of the records that I've been able to find. Talking with some other folks, there were no major, there were no male Bideaus running around at that time. So obviously we have a historical problem that we haven't been able to sort out. But anyhow, we see that we have a. We have basically two senior citizens at that time, because I guess in, in, uh, at the age of 54 in 1786, it's probably pretty close to being a, uh, a senior citizen in, uh, in today's world. They probably would be up uh, in, in their late 80s, I think, or mid 80s, anyhow. It's, it was a, a hard life that he lived. Mary Esther's life is, I guess, apparently pretty easy. She lived on her plantation called Black Branch, and apparently she was not, she had a relatively easy life, although it was not Spencer, up until her marriage to Francis in 1786. Uh, obviously at that age, one would be surprised if they had any children of their own, and that's correct, they did not. But what they did do, they, uh, first off, Francis Marion being ever, probably ever cognizant of his, uh, of his lineage, and wanting to make sure that something passed down beyond him, uh, adopted Francis Marion Dwight. Francis Marion Dwight is the, is the boy that Francis Marion wrote the letter to that, that I read to you. Francis Marion uh, Dwight was the son of Rebecca Marion Dwight, who was the daughter of Francis' brother Isaac. So that would make Francis Marion Dwight Francis Marion grand nephew. Um, I know it's kind of tough to keep the genealogy together because it really gets confusing when, when cousins are marrying cousins and adopting grand nephews. So if you don't follow along, uh, I probably might mess up myself. So, at that point in time, Francis Mary Dwight, who was, was still a nephew, was 17 years old. So in that letter that we, we saw was written to him when I, when I believe he was going to Yale. Uh, the letter was addressed to Stratford, Connecticut, no, I couldn't find a college in Stratford. Connecticut. However, 
New Haven where Yale is located is about 15 miles away. So that was my guess that he was going to Yale. And I believe his a uh, uncle or, or maybe a nephew of his actually wound up being a doctor from, from you know, Francis Marion Dwight. And Francis Marion's will is what uh, we're going to some of the details on. Francis Marion wrote, in case my nephew, Francis Marion Dwight, shall always take a him the name of Francis Marion, and then adopt him as my son, and do give and bequeath unto him, all in singular, to the real personal estate, after my wife's widowhood or death. Uh, the interesting thing about this statement, besides the fact that he's, he's going to uh, will all his property to a, a nephew who will take his name, is that um, his wife, Mary Espado, is bequeathed everything unless she remarries. Apparently, the, the, the pattern was if, if, uh, if, if the man died, his wife and his wife remarried, it was not unusual at all for the, uh, the bequeath that she received to be basically returned to the, to the second heir, I suppose you could say. Uh, and, and a real problem with, I guess, the wives remarrying and then perhaps the, the new second husband reaping the benefits of the first husband's uh, gains. And this was, uh, apparently, this, this was not unusual at all in those, those old wills. Finally, in 1799, Francis Marion Dwight, you can see by an act of the General Assembly, to enable Francis Marion Dwight to his present name to that of Francis Marion. So 1799 was four years after Marion's death. Francis Marion now had, had in, uh, in absentia almost, uh, had his adopted son. The sole purpose of generating male uh, children to continue the, his line. Unfortunately, Francis Marion, we'll call him Junior, uh, did not have any male heirs. He was married twice. The first wife died in probably a year. The second wife had eight girls, no boys. So all, for, all, 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 all the Swan Fox's efforts went in vain because his, his designated heir did not have any one to succeed. Thus ended the line of Francis Mary, either uh, directly or indirectly. There was a second adopted child that is, I've only ever found two accounts of. And this one is the adopted, this is her, her name is Charlotte Vito Ashby. Uh, she was called the adopted daughter of Mary Esther Marion, more often than the adopted daughter of both of them. What that signified, I'm not really quite sure, but I just thought kind of curious that, that that's how she would, she would be characterized. And this this woman, Charlotte Vido Ashby, obviously she has Vido as a middle name, and that, I'm not sure where how that would have been. Uh, although she now she, she now became the adopted daughter of Mary Esther Vido Marion, and of course she was the daughter of Charlotte Marion Ashby, who was the daughter of Francis Marion's brother Gabriel. And who, curiously enough, Charlotte Marion Ashby was married to uh, Charlotte Marion Ashby's cousin, Theodore Samuel Marion, who was uh, Joe Marion's son, on the same day that Francis Marion married uh, Mary Esther B. Dutton. We have a double, we have a double, a double ceremony at Little Pond Bluff on the same day. So this is all pretty closely intertwined families. Uh, so Marion has his military life, he has his domestic life. Uh, at the same time while this is going on, don't forget, he has to make a living, and I'll get into that last, but basically he's also following politics. So uh, I don't know how he could balance all these, all these balls at the same time, especially whenever the war ended, his little plantation is, has been decimated. He basically gets a job at Fort Johnson, mainly because got all the good will of the state of South Carolina because he doesn't have any money. So in one sense, he, he is, his, his money, his income is coming from being a commander of Fort Johnson at the, uh, at the good graces of the state of South Carolina. Same time though, he's still in politics too. 
Now, in, as the war closed down, the General Assembly was convened in Jacksonburg, which is about 30 some miles from Charlestown. And Francis Marion was, was a senator. And he was, he, he continued in the Senate uh, through 1786 when he was succeeded by William Moore. Uh, I've gone through the first session of the, of the uh, Senate minutes from that, that first session of 1782, and it, that, there really isn't anything that, that stands out as far as what Francis Marion was, was doing in, that, in those minutes. But if you read the minutes of any of these sessions, they're all pretty, they're all pretty boring, and there really isn't a whole lot said. It's really just facts, and that's about it. There's not really too much else said. So I'm not saying that he wasn't a leader of men in that Senate. I'm just saying that nothing that jumps out at you. Um, there, is, there is some verbiage that says that he was a big proponent of education. But once again, I can't really say that either because I can't find anything that really establishes that. And he stayed in the Senate for four years. And then he left, succeeded by William Moultrie. Why he left the Senate? No idea. It was probably a good idea to go out and make some money. I think that's probably that may have been a good reason to do it. Plus, he was getting married in 1786, so maybe he just decided to back out because of that, too. Um, but he did, must have been in good enough condition from a financial and a, a domestic side, where back in, in December 1791, he joined the Senate again, or he was elected to the Senate. This is from Berkeley, St. John's, Berkeley County. And he stayed in the Senate until May of 1794. So this is, he stayed in the Senate until, what, 10 months before, before his death. And Moultrie, he, uh, he's, he succeeded Moultrie in, in 1791. And then, interesting to me, anyhow, in 1794, he was succeeded by Henry Lawrence. And of course, Henry Lawrence is one of the senior statesmen of South Carolina, you know, who had been president of the Continental Congress. And it just kind of, kind of surprised me that Henry Lawrence, uh, of that fame, go join the, the uh, South Carolina Senate again. But in addition to all these things going on, Marion was also a justice of the quorum. Now, uh, I don't know what justice of the quorum is. Right? I, can't, I couldn't find any definition of what the duties were of justice of the quorum. Uh, I queried Karen McNutt, and she indicated to me that, that uh, this was a chairman of a three justice type court to handle civil cases, as opposed to a justice of the peace who handled the uh, criminal cases. Uh, that was good enough for me. Apparently, this was a lifetime uh, appointment also. So maybe Francis Marion generated a little more income than that. I don't know. Uh, and then Francis Marion was also uh, present at the Constitutional Convention of South Carolina when the state uh, convened to ratify the US Constitution. This is in 1788. What is interesting about this to me was that Marion was in fact a member of this convention. However, when it came to voting, he was not there for the vote. And I'm disappointed. I have no idea why, there's no mention why Francis Marion would not be present for such an important vote. But he wasn't there. Another one of those little questions, you just kind of scratch your head. You wonder, maybe he was sick. I mean, that's like, it could be as simple as that. No idea. And that basically is a you know, brief stride in his political, political career. So what we've seen so far is that Marion he, 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 uh, continues to function in the military. Uh, and we see that there are a few errors in the recorded history of his military career. Uh, he, he gets married, has a couple kids, uh, one of whom is not really mentioned anywhere, or very, very rarely mentioned. And then we also have his political career, in which is really not given any any real uh, discussion in any biographies whatsoever. Right? It basically said he served in the Senate after after the the, uh, the war, and that's about as far as it goes. Uh, something else that at least was new to me, and I see that uh, Karen also has a picture of it. This picture is one of Francis Marion that was donated by the South Carolina Society uh, to Mount Vernon in 1884. I, I don't remember how I came across this, but it, apparently this is a, uh, a painting that is not really very uh, 
prevalent in, in any of the uh, documents. I've, ne I've never seen anywhere except Mary, except Karen happened to have it out on her board on Thursday too. So you must think in the same way. It's pretty scary. Now we get into Marion's property. As you see from the letter that uh, that Reggie, normally in a letter you'll see that it gives you the date and it gives you the location from whence it was, it was written. The letter, and I just gave you the, the date of that letter up here. Uh, it was kind of curious to me that Marion did not put the, lo the location from which he wrote his last letter. Um, I think it's pretty, it's probably pretty obvious that it would have been from Pond Bluff, his plantation. So I'm kind of assuming that's what it was. But that kind of brings me back to, well, what property did Marion really own? The narrow view is, <coughs> if we once again go back to his biographies, and my recollection is that the only mention of any property that Marion owned is Pond Bluff. Marion went back to Pond Bluff and Village Plantation and lived happily ever after. Uh, well, obviously that's not the case because apparently Pond Bluff, looking from looking at deed records and deed transactions, um, Apparently it was only 200 acres after it, got, after it was all chopped up, which would not have been enough to subsist, period, especially with a, a, a family to raise. In actuality, and I'm, this is where I started, well, I should put this all in quotes, because I, I have some substantiation of this, and this is where some of this percolation of information comes from. Um, I have, I, I recently found a document that indicates that Francis Marion owned nearly 6,000 acres and not 200 acres of Pond Bluff and whatever assumed land that Mary yesterday did with that. So all of a sudden, Mary, Francis Marion really, at least apparently based on this, this documentation, was a pretty wealthy landowner. 6,000 acres is, is really nothing to really, really do. No. But, now this is a comparison to John Rutledge, Governor of Governor John Rutledge, who owned 107,000 acres. So you can see, in retrospect, 6,000 acres seemed like a whole lot of property, and I would be happy to have 6,000 acres myself. But of course, John Rutledge would have to outdo Francis Marion because John Rutledge was the upper crust of South Carolina. In this real estate, we know we have the Pond Bluff. Uh, apparently. The, Francis Marion also owned Black Branch because that was the plantation that uh, Mary Esther Bedeau brought in the marriage. She may have brought other property in too. I just don't have any, any record of that. But I've also at least been able to find from two sources, and nevertheless, there are there is some, there are some questions about that. Is the Rocks Plantation? Uh, the Rocks Plantation. And I have a little map here that I'll show you. Uh, the Rocks Plantation is really was at least the local map I have, is below Black Branch and Pond Bluff. And Marion wrote two letters from it in June of 1781. So, uh, number one, I know a Rocks Plantation existed in 1781 because there are there's, there's documentation of two letters. Um, whether Francis Marion owned it, I can't find a deed on it. However, I do have a writ, a writ of partition in the case that he owned Rocks Plantation in 1378, and I'll show you these maps. These. Now there, there may be a question because Peter Gayard in 1794 bought a Rocks Plantation, and, and it would have been the, the same location. Uh, and however, the document that I'm using as my basis of, of, of my contention is dated 1818. So there's some, as I say, there are some issues here about validity, but I want to present them anyhow because I think in the end result, in some cases it's not so much the, the details, it's just the, the, the overall number. I think 6,000 acres is a lot of land. He also owned apparently 3,400 acres of timberland in pasture. Can't find any idea where that is. I haven't been able to even close to that. And Francis Mayer also received a grant from the state of South Carolina for 302 acres. This is the first half of it. As a result of his service during the war, uh, and actually this is the actual document itself, was as a result of passage of an act in 1778, um, officers of the, uh, probably officers as well as just your, you know, your militia soldiers were granted property, land grants in the state of South Carolina. 
This actual land grant is granted the day of 1784, and the actual 302 acres uh, property, which I have outlined there in red, were granted. I'm not really quite sure where this property was yet, but it does show some familiar names, one being William Gibbs, at the bottom here, one being um, Robert and James McKelvey. Those names are significant because <clears throat> I understand that the land on which Utah Springs was built, or was fought, Valley Utah Springs was, was fought, was owned by the McKelveys. Uh, and incident, incidentally, they always call it Roach's Plantation, and the wife of Thomas Roach was a Marion. I don't remember which one of the brew, but was also a Marion. So all these things tend to tie together. It's just it's bizarre. I think as uh, Keith Gordine was telling me earlier, earlier today, he's located approximately 50, 50 some Marion plantations. So uh, we have a pretty big widespread family that was uh, pretty wealthy, very wealthy. That's the end. This was actually, I guess it was actually recorded in Valley Grants, August 1785. And the other time span for any of uh, Marion's land holdings, I'm not really sure what the, what the dates are something that may or may not ever come to light. <clears throat> so Marion is now a, a major property owner. And you can see here some of the locations. Uh, I'm going to see it in my five minutes here, so let me just quickly go through give me this pointer to work here. Uh, Pond, Pond Bluff is right here. Uh, here's Black Branch, so you have both of those. Down here is the rocks. And what you're seeing here, this is the Santee River. Up here is Belle Isle. This is where Francis Marion's buried. So, just to give you a perspective, that may not really get it, do it for you, but I can show you these maps afterwards. But you can see this is amazing. And you see Walnut Grove, that was a Gabriel Marion plantation there, also. So, this is just five plantations that are in here, four, four of them. Uh, let me just flip on that's just a blow off of the other one. Let me show you. Here's some more <coughs> maps of uh, uh, the St. John, St. Saint, Saint Stephen's Parish. This is a 1773 map, so we're talking pre-war here. And you can see the Santee River. It goes, you can see how it runs. The Murray's Ferry is up there at the top, and you get a little perspective. And down at the bottom, we're getting down, starting to move down toward uh, Monk's Corner. Uh, you see in red, these are Marion plantations. Now, they're Francis. This should be Belle Isle right here. Now, we think of Belle Isle as it's Gabriel Marion's plantation. And where, Mar and where Francis is buried. You'll see two houses here. So I'm not sure what that uh, suggests, but there, there could be another Marion plantation owned there. Over here is a Marion plantation, and I have no record of, of ownership. This may have been one called Springfield, I think was a big name right there. And then coming down through this Greenland swamp, you see a Marion plantation here. I don't know what that one is. Down here's another Marion plantation. Now, this one may have been a Harbin plantation, which ultimately was owned by Marion's uh, nephew Theodore. But in 1773, Theodore wasn't age, <coughs> so I don't really know who these owners are, but once again, it does show us that Marion's were very prominent landowners, even back in 1773. Uh, finally, we see Marion the twilight of his life. 1794, obviously his political career is over, his military career is over. Uh, at that point in time, his, his health is declining, so he, he's probably not the most active person as far as uh, his land holdings go. The letter that we started out with, from November 8, 1794, uh, gives us another indication of what was going on at the end of his life. And it says that the cramp is in my finger and cannot write more. These may have been indications of osteoarthritis or possibly rheumatoid arthritis, both of which at that age and the life he lived or don't seem too unusual if you have those at age at 62 years old. Um, then the, the next statement is where he writes, my cell is very ailing and constant pain in my head for some time by a cold but ardent fever. Now we have, we have a couple of ideas about that and there, there are probably five or ten more. These are just two that have come up. One was I, I queried a, a physician who was writing, a, a, coincidentally, a biography of William Moultrie, 
I just send this, this letter and he said, well, you know, they, they could be symptoms of malaria. And that kind of fit with Mary and his wife. But uh, living in the swamps, I uh, would not be too surprised that Mary would have uh, gotten malaria sometime or other in his life. So that, that may have been the, the, what he was suffering from was the ultimate cause of death. Or as Cameron Nutt has suggested, it might possibly be from lead poisoning. Um, if you read Mary and he, his favorite drink was a mixture of vinegar and water. And vinegar, of course, being acetic acid, uh, I'm going to speak for you, Karen. Karen's uh, suggestion is that because Marion would drink, be drinking out of a canteen, and a, con a canteen being sealed via lead solder, that lead could be uh, the acetic acid from the vinegar could be eating away the lead, therefore Marion could be ingesting lead from the canteen, as well as a pewter mug, uh, a crystal glassware at that time was contained lead as well. So uh, uh, Karen was suggesting that Mary, Francis Marion died from lead poisoning. Uh, not a very nice way to go, I suppose. But regards to that, Mary did die in February 1795. What happened afterwards? Ah, now the good stuff. Now when things really get rich. Wills. Bane of all, all, all people's existence is what to do with the will. Mary had an early will, 17, I'm thinking 1773. It was after he bought one plantation, which I'm suggesting was Pond Bluff. So that would have been 1773. In that will, he gave all the slaves, except, his, except six of them, to his nephew Robert. Robert Marion was the son of Gabriel. Robert became a U.S. Uh, representative. Um, Marion or Francis Marion freed three of his slaves. One was June. That was his faithful Negro man. He also gave June 20 pounds per year. Uh, Francis intended, see, these, these are all intentions. He intended to free Willoughby, his good old nurse, plus one suit of clothes and 20 pounds per year. And Francis intended to free the musty girl, Peggy. Musty girl, musty is a uh, mixture of uh, black and Indian. He was planning on freeing her, giving her clothes, and learned to read and write and live on the plantation until she was 15 years old. The major bequeath went to William, who was a natural son of Gabriel. That means basically that, that William was born out of wedlock. So that would we would think would be the oldest son of Gabriel because Gabriel did get married, so let's hope he was the oldest son of him. And Gabriel, or William was given the same tea plantation, which we assume was upon well. In addition, he was given 2,000 pounds sterling. That's a lot of money, a lot of money. One slave, surprisingly. What's he gonna do with a plantation with one slave? I don't know, hopefully. We must assume that he has, he has some other property there. Plus, he was gonna give clothing and living and he gets his youngest uh, nephew, Gabriel, this is Gabriel Jr., uh, Francis' brother Gabriel's son, who ultimately died in the war, so he's gonna give him his English horse. All this changed, of course, because Prince of Mary married. That will was out the window. As you'll see, he's, he's, he's free of slaves, but that's all by the wayside now. It was all dedicated to Francis Mary and Dwight. And once again, that was assuming that Francis Mary and Dwight would take the name of Francis Mary and become his son. Other than that, Mary Esther Mary and his wife would be giving everything she brought into the marriage plus the balance of the estate. It was against, until her death or end of widowhood. So if you want to get remarried, you're going to lose it. Okay, and then, unfortunately, although Mary intended to give Francis Mary and Dwight uh, his estate after Mary and Esther died, Francis Marion died without a witness to his will. As a result, Will was in, he died intestate without, without any witness. As a result, Francis Mary and Dwight is disinherited. So this whole intention of giving everything to Francis Mary and Dwight all of a sudden goes by the wayside. Although there is some documentation that says he was given half the personal property. But I haven't known to substantiate that. Instead, the estate's divided among 10 nieces and nephews. So now we have 10 nieces and nephews fighting over his estate. Ultimately, Mary Esther, uh, Mary, Francis Mary's wife, reobtained all the property that was divided among those, those 10 nieces and nephews. Now, now we get down to the good stuff. What happened in, in his estate itself? His estate was worth, um, in, in 
say in $2,009, $575,000. And that's not counting the value of the property. But that, that's, if you think about that, yeah, that's not, not really a real, you know, the state of a super, super rich man, obviously with all the property, he's a pretty rich man. But not, not significant amount, especially considering that, that in an early will, he was going to give his nephew, William, 2000 So 15 or 20 years, although the pound is going to change dramatically, not that much significant. Other issues, I just point out some of the issues, or some of the points in Mary's will. Mary had 74 slaves that were listed in the, in the inventory of his estate. And that's compared to in, in 1790, in the 1790 census of South Carolina, Mary owned 194 slaves. At that point in time, he was the 30th largest owner of slaves in South Carolina. Now, those, those numbers also are questionable because Thomas Sumter was not even listed in the 1790 census. So if Thomas Sumter wasn't listed, and he was as wealthy as he was, which was apparently much more wealthy than Marion was, there were probably a lot of other people who weren't listed in the census. But regardless of that, Marion owned 74 slaves in, at, at the time of his death. The first slave mentioned in his, in his inventory and, and was the one of the highest value of 100 pounds was Buddy. Buddy is the, is the slave that I contend is the real Oscar that is, is portrayed as Marion's manservant in the books starting with William Dovine James and, and going up. I have found that um, through three different sources that Marion's manservant, at least at the end of his life, his name was Buddy and not Oscar. Now, there could have been an Oscar and he could have died and we could have been free, but the end of his life, the most valued slave was Buddy, and he was also one who dates back to the 17, late 1780s, as you mentioned in correspondence. Uh, real quick, then, we have, you can see, just you can read down some of these. I think the interesting thing, Mary had, had a backgammon table. I thought that was kind of, kind of cool that you could have a backgammon table. A friend of mine pointed out that he didn't have any books. There were no books as part of his, uh, as part of, part of his estate, uh, which I was kind of surprised. I guess the guy's pretty busy. He just didn't have a lot of leisure time. Wasn't that, wasn't that type of a guy? He had a mahogany commode. I thought that was kind of curious. <laughs> As opposed to, I don't know, cypress commode. I don't know what. He had indigo hooks, which you'd expect him to have indigo because that's what he would be growing there. And he had four gin cases. Now, at first, I don't know what this really would, would be gin cases. I, mean, I don't recall any discussions about drinking gin. But, uh, and you could say, well, maybe cotton gin. But anyhow, uh, if anybody knows what these gin cases would be, I'd be really curious. I, I, I like to think that them as being the alcoholic type. Makes a much better story. <laughs> uh, he also had large looking glasses. Uh, I'm assuming those are like eyeglasses for reading type things. Um, although I don't know what small looking glasses. Mirror. 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 Looking glass mirror. Okay. Just threw that. Thank you. <laughs> And also, interestingly, he had the 35% of Marion's estate was tied up in bonds. Basically, these are loans that he made to his family. He had loans out to uh, Theodore Samuel Marion. He had two of those, and I understand those were never really paid, or they were grudgingly paid back. Uh, one to uh, his brother-in-law, who was Anthony Ashby, who had died in uh, 1783 or something like that. So this dead for 12 years and he still carried that bond. But basically, there's 2,288 pounds that Marion had as, as assets that probably were, they were giving, they were giving, they were giving away. <coughs> and that is pretty much the, the highlights of, of his estate. And finally, the other new thing that we have, and this is, this is the, the end here, is no one's ever seen a picture of Francis Marion when he wore his mustache. Francis Marion, in January 1788, were Mustangs. After the siege of Savannah, he wrote a letter to Isaac Carlson, who was his adjutant, second command. And he wrote, when you see me, you'll find I have a formal pair of mustachios. All the way regiment now wear And if you have not one, you will be seen. Francis Marion with a mustache. <laughs> Thank you. Please take the five